So I'll be reading from Mark chapter 11, the first 11 verses this morning. Mark 11, the first 11 verses. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered had Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming king of our father, kingdom of our father David. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Bill, for your prayer and for the reading. It's now April, and probably for a lot of us in our homes, it's time for, for spring cleaning. Maybe not one of, your, one of your favorite things to do, one of your favorite rituals uh, throughout the year. As I was doing, this, uh, doing the research for this sermon and reflecting on it this week, I, I thought about that spring cleaning, and thought about maybe where it has its roots. You might not know this, but this coming Friday, yeah, Good Friday for us, for those of the Jewish faith, it's the beginning of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is, you know, corresponds with uh, Jesus in his, uh, his trial and crucifixion when he was eating the Last Supper with his disciples. That was the Passover meal, the Passover Seder. <clears throat> Part of the Part of the preparations of, uh, for the Jewish people, for people of that faith, part of their preparations is uh, leading up to Passover is to give the house a good cleaning. One, and one of the things that they do is they remove all, all yeast or leaven from, from the house. Now, that's, it's kind of a symbolic way of reminding themselves that... Um, Leaven or yeast can symbolize sin. And now you might wonder, well, why, is, you know, why does yeast get such a bad rap, right? Why, why does yeast symbolize sin? Well, it symbolizes sin in the sense that it, as you know, yeast puffs up bread, right? That's what makes bread rise. Yes? Everybody's, okay, everyone's tracking with me here. Good, good. Okay, yeast is what makes bread rise. It puffs it up, Right? And that puffing up, when we puff ourselves up, is the, you know, the sin of pride. And in the way scripture describes it, that was the original sin, right? Well, the original sin of Adam and Eve in the garden was thinking that they could be like God, believing that lie that Satan told them, that they would be like God, that pride, that original sin. So removing yeast from the house is a way of, of you know, self-examination, removing sin from our lives, Clean, you know, giving our, ourselves, say, a good spring cleaning. And for the Jewish people, it also reminds them of their identity. It reminds them of, of who they are, that they were once slaves in Egypt, and that that feast of unleavened bread, that feast of Passover, reminds them of how God redeemed them 
from slavery in Egypt, led them through the Red Sea and the wilderness for 40 years, and then eventually brought them to the promised land. So it reminds them of the, <clears throat> of the call to, to clean out your heart, to clean out your life, to remove the yeast, to remember who they are as God's people. Now, in observant Jewish homes, even today, people will do this. And now oftentimes what they'll do is, is make a game of it. They will, uh, a parent or grandparent will, will hide somewhere in the house uh, a little bit of yeast or leaven. And the, the child or grandchild who finds that gets, you know, gets a gift. So we can, but we can see how it is that that concept of spring cleaning around this time of year is invested with religious significance. Maybe not necessarily in our faith, but certainly in the Jewish faith. And who knows? Maybe your mother was right. Maybe cleanliness really is next to godliness. How does that relate to the passage that Bill read a moment ago? Well, we'll try to make some connections here. So, as you may know, the, the chapter and verse divisions in Scripture were brought in much later. And so it helps to look at what comes before and what comes after this passage. So if you look just before, the passage just before this, Jesus has gone through the city of Jericho. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's predicted his death in Jerusalem three times already now. He's, so he's gone through the city of Jericho, which is near Jerusalem, and he's healed a blind man by the name of Bartimaeus. And we're told in verse 46, at the beginning of that, that passage, just before this one we read, that large crowds were following him. And we're also told that Bartimaeus, who was blind, at least physically, perhaps he could see something spiritually that others couldn't. Because he cries out when he hears Jesus is coming, when he, when he hears this, this crowd coming down the road, he cries out to Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He, was, he invested who Jesus was with messianic significance. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then we read that, that Jesus <clears throat> comes to him and he heals him of his blindness, a supernatural healing. And you can imagine that by this point, this large crowd that's been following Jesus for some time now, seeing him perform miracles, hearing him teach, and seeing him heal the, poor, heal the sick, seeing him do all sorts of things that they would have expected the Messiah to do. The, the expectations for Jesus at this time, the, I mean, the curve is steep here, right? I mean, this is like Tiger Woods returning to play in the Masters again after, you know, after being injured and being probably past the prime of most golfers. This is, so at this point, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem with this large crowd following him, with people identifying him as the son of David, the Messiah, with people having seen him heal and hear him teach. And he approaches Jerusalem. He approaches two small towns on the Mount of Olives. Now, if you've ever been to Israel in, you know, in recent years, Jerusalem is a, is a large metropolitan city. It would have been much smaller in Jesus' time. Not just population-wise, but geographically. I mean, everything would have been, had to have been in, a, a, in proximity where people could walk to the things that they needed. Bethany and Bethpage were small t villages on the Mount of Olives, which is now part of just the greater area of Jerusalem. But at that time, they were distinct villages. Bethany in particular, that's where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. That's where 
Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha, who were some of the closest followers of Jesus, that's where they lived. Bethany was where Jesus had done his greatest miracle, raising Lazarus from the dead. And so Bethany would have been this place where Jesus was popular. This was like a homecoming for him. He would have, and so there's this large crowd, these high expectations for who Jesus is. And then he comes to this town where, where he is, he's all that in a bag of chips. I mean, he is just, he is popular here. He, and so the, the expectations for Jesus are huge at this point. I mean, we, we know that we know that the expectations are huge. We know that he's well known because when he says to the disciples, he says to two of his disciples, we're told there, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and we'll send it back here shortly. And then, it happen, what happens is just what Jesus described would happen. These disciples go, they find a colt, they're untying it, and somebody says, hey, hold on, just a minute. Why are you taking this colt? And they say the Lord needs it. They tell them, the people there, what, exactly what Jesus told them to say. And they don't have to ask who the Lord is. They seem to know. It's not as if the disciples have to say, Oh, Jesus, the, the traveling rabbi from Nazareth in Galilee, he needs the colt. They just say the Lord needs it, and he'll send it back here shortly. And they say, all right, great, proceed, go on. And so after they untie the colt, when, when they brought the colt to Jesus, we're told that the disciples throw their cloaks on it, and others threw their cloaks on the road, and Others spread branches and they shout, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Not the coming kingdom of God, the coming kingdom of our father David. We want to reestablish the earthly kingdom that we had in the Old Testament. We want these, these Roman occupiers gone. And I mean, and, and we, can, we can see, we can kind of have a sense of, of that feeling that the people of Israel might have had in this time, wanting those Roman occupiers gone. I mean, when we see things like what are, what's happening in Ukraine today. I mean, you can, you can just maybe imagine how the Ukrainians feel especially in areas that are controlled by the Russians, how they feel about those occupying armies. They want them gone. And the sooner the better. And the more of them that die in the process, well, that's just fine with most of them. That's how the, the people of Israel would have felt about the Roman occupiers at this time. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. We want a kingdom here and now. We want a kingdom that lives up to our expectations. We want a, a kingdom of our own making. And if this Jesus can give it to us, well, great. You see, the people who welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday wanted a savior of their own devising. And, and sometimes... That's what we want. We want a savior of our own devising. We want him to do things our way on our timetable. That's the sin of pride. That's that yeast that we're puffed up. We think that we know better than Jesus what kind of savior we need. But look what Jesus does here. The way he embraces this, this, prophetic, uh, this prophetic description from Zechariah in his actions, right? They bring their clo the colt to Jesus and Jesus rides in on this colt. And there's no pride there. He's a humble savior, 
There is no yeast there. No pride. That original sin. And at the time of the Passover feast, the feast of the unleavened bread, in a sense what Jesus is doing here is he's, he's saying, as he would later on in that Holy Week, at the Last Supper, he's saying, I am the unleavened bread. I'm the one with no yeast. I'm the one with no sin. And when he gathers with his disciples later that week around that table and he breaks that bread, that unleavened bread and gives it to them and says, this is my body, take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. When he gives that, bo- that bread to his disciples later that week, that bread with no yeast, no pride, Passover is fulfilled. The Passover that was celebrated first when God brought his people out of Egypt. But you see, like those people on that first Palm Sunday, we want to be saved in the way we want to be saved. We want to expect Jesus to give us the good life we want, the good life we think we deserve, not necessarily the holy life that Jesus wants to give us. How do we respond when Jesus clearly has other plans? A little bit later on in this passage, at the end of this passage, in verse 11, Jesus, we read, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts and he looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. There's kind of an anticlimactic ending there, isn't there? The other gospel, descri- gospel writers describe it differently. But in Mark, there's a bit of an anticlimactic ending. It seems like Jesus walks into the temple courts, and as Mark says, it's getting late. He maybe looks around, decides, well, go home for tonight. Call it a day. Come back tomorrow. And he does come back. A few verses later in verse 15, we read that Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer? for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples again went back out of the city. Well, what's the significance of those verses? Just a few a few verses later, a day later in the, in the narrative we're following. I mean, is, is Jesus just going in and knocking heads and flipping over tables? Why, why is this important that Mark records for us this cleansing of the temple? Well, back to the spring cleaning at the beginning. We need to ask ourselves, what's the What's the significance of the temple? Well, in the Old Testament, the temple, of course, in the tabernacle before it, was the place where the presence of God dwelled. And in the New Testament, the New Testament writers make it very clear that the fullness of God's presence dwelt in Jesus Christ. That he was truly human, and truly divine. And beyond that, if you look, just uh, if you have your Bibles with you, just for a quick sec, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 
In verse 19, there Paul says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So Paul's saying there to us individually, do you not know? And the way that question is phrased in Greek, it expects a yes answer. Of course this is something you should know, Paul is saying. This would be like you know, your mother saying, didn't I tell you? I mean, obviously she's told you, right? And if you answer, well, no, that probably doesn't go well, right? It doesn't end well. Paul says, do you not know? Do you not know that your bodies are temples? He uses that word very, very intentionally. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Your body, your, your temple, God, Paul says, is created to be made holy, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be entirely given over to God and his work in this world. And not only us individually, flip over a few several pages later, again, if you have your Bibles with you, to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And he says this about God's people as a group. Not just us individually, but us as a group. He says in chapter 2 of of Ephesians, in verse 19, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building, the temple, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. In other words, God is building a community of faith that is called to be holy, that is called to be filled with the Holy Spirit, just as we individually are called to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We as individuals and as a community are called to be given over completely to what God has called us to do and who he's called us to be. So Jesus cleans out the temple. And then that prompts us to ask if we individually and as a community of faith are the temple, how is it during Lent and in this Holy Week in particular, how is it that this can be a time when we're cleaned out, when we get a spring cleaning, so to speak, individually and as a church? Maybe in this week, as we anticipate coming to the table on Good Friday, and remembering, as Paul says, that price with which we were bought, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, maybe it's a time for us to examine our hearts and our lives. Maybe, maybe there's some sin in our lives that, that the Holy Spirit wants to convict us of, and being open to that and repenting and receiving the gift of God's grace and the gift of new life to forsake that sin and leave it behind. Maybe it's the sin of pride, that being puffed up. Maybe there's some yeast in our life that needs to be taken out of the house, cleaned out. Maybe there's some motivation Maybe there's some relationship between ourselves and another person that needs healing, needs cleaning up. Maybe our our priorities have gotten out of whack. Whatever it is, 
this holy week in particular for each of us and for us as a church. There's a, a place for being cleansed, for being cleaned out, for having that spring cleaning. And it forces us to ask, will we demand a savior like the people that first Palm Sunday did? Will we demand a savior who embraces our agenda and our priorities? Will we demand a savior in the form we'd like or will we allow him to do the the sometimes unpleasant work of spring cleaning? Maybe this week you'll do some spring cleaning around the house or in the yard. And maybe you'll take some time to allow the Holy Spirit to do some spring cleaning in your heart. To allow the Holy Spirit to convict you of sin, to remind you of of your identity as one of God's people and call you and call us as a church to follow Jesus more faithfully. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you are our Savior. That you are our Lord. And that you came in humility. You came and took on human flesh, became one of us, And that as you lived, you embraced our humanity and fully showed the humility that you were given. You could have, Lord, demanded that the throne of all the kingdoms of this earth be given to you, and you would have been within your rights. You could have demanded deference and that all those around you serve you, but instead you served. Instead of riding on a mighty stallion, welcomed with trumpets, you rode on a donkey, welcomed with the shouts of the common people. And so, Lord, We pray that in this holy week you would help us to follow you in humility. Help us to see your kingdom coming. Help us to long for it, not the coming kingdom of our father David or whatever earthly kingdom we might desire, but your kingdom. Help us, Lord, to set aside our priorities, our agenda, so that we can receive the grace that you give and embrace the way of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.